Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Priscilla. My pronouns are she, her. And thank you for joining our COVID-19 community conversation um, hosted by the UW Medicine Office of Healthcare Equity. Today, we'll be talking about therapeutics and treatments. And I will turn this over to Dr. Chopra for introductions. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Community Conversations by UW Medicine. This is actually a really uh, much requested episode where we'll talk about therapeutics, the different medications and infusions that are available in the hospital, as well as outpatients to manage COVID-19. We've all heard of several names of drugs. Some of them are really difficult to pronounce, <laughs> but uh, our hopes today uh, you know, is that our experts will help us understand these medications and when they are advised. I'm Anita Chopra. I'm an internal medicine physician at UW Medicine Shoreline. Please pardon my background. My colleagues here have much better backgrounds than I have. We have Dr. Santiago Neme. Dr. Neme is a medical director, UW Medical Center, Northwest Campus. He's senior associate medical director, UW Medical Center. And he is a, a clinical associate professor of medicine in the division of allergy and infectious diseases. Thank you so much, Dr. Neme. We also have Rupali Jain. Rupali is co-director of antimicrobial stewardship at the University of Washington Medical Center. She's also ID pharmacy residency program director uh, in the UW School of Pharmacy. We have Priscilla, uh, who is our community and workforce engagement specialty, specialist in the Office of Healthcare Equity. So uh, Rupali, we'll start off with you. And if you could just um, explain to us uh, the different difference between the outpatient and the inpatient therapeutics, uh, what are dif the different names uh, of medications that we hear and how can we explain it to our community in a very simple uh, way? Sure, thank you, Dr. Chopra. Yeah, we, we over the course of COVID, the COVID pandemic, we've learned a lot about how to treat and manage patients, both in the hospital as well as in the, in the clinic setting. What, what, what we'll focus on today is a little bit of, of both, but mainly on the outpatient because that's all the new and exciting information and probably um, what you'll most likely encounter. So when, when the pandemic started in 2020, we learned about a new antiviral therapy. And this is given by, by your vein, and this is called remdesivir. So this helps stop the virus from making copies of itself. And that is given for five, about five days in the hospital. And it, it has been shown to help people or help patients recover quickly, quicker than not having therapy. And so that has been a, a mainstay of therapy since, since 2020. And we've been now, we've been using it in the outpatient setting. And we'll talk about that in, in a moment. In addition to the antiviral that we use, um, there's also some anti-inflammatory medications such as steroids um, that, that we use when patients are in the ICU. Now this is um, an important um, complement to the antiviral. Um, and again, this is a, a medication that we use for other reasons, but we found that it also helps with COVID pneumonia. So moving to more outpatient therapies, this is where a lot of the recent excitement um, has, has been um, occurring. And we, we've had a lot of different options, but I think the, the ones that we're really excited about are the oral medications that will be available um, at many pharmacies um, across the nation. Um, and so those are the oral antivirals. The, new, the newest one is called um, Paxlovid, um, Nermatrelivir, and Ritonavir. And this one, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it works similar to the other antivirals. It just stops the um, virus from making proteins, and so it just can't make copies of itself. Um, the other medication that we have that is an oral antiviral is called molnupiravir. This is also stops the virus from making copies. It just makes it, makes it have a lot of errors. And so it doesn't, can't function. 
And then the last and the most exciting is the monoclonal antibodies. Now this feels like a new, new term, but it's, we've had monoclonal antibodies for a long time. And what these are are just lab generated antibodies that really have a specific target. And what they target is the, the virus. And the virus, um, it stops the virus from making copies of itself as well. Now, all of these therapies that are used in the outpatient, the most important thing is to give it so, as soon as you develop symptoms. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go, but like most antivirals, they need to be given as soon as possible. And then last, we have a new prevention medication, um, which is also a monoclonal antibody. And that is a long acting one. And this is really designed for our immunosuppressed or patients with a weakened immune systems um, to help boost their, their um, antibody levels so they can fight the virus. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ripali, for giving us this amazing overview. Um, I think you really explained it very simply to us uh, on the therapies that are available. And uh, I think we can go and dig deeper a little bit into each one of them. And Dr. Nemi, I would like to talk a little bit about the monoclonal antibodies that were there in the beginning of the pandemic, which at one point only uh, was the only COVID therapy that we heard of and was given to patients who were really sick and hospitalized. Uh, so are they still being used and which patients are they reserved for? Yeah, so currently, um, as the pandemic has evolved and changed um, through the different variants that we've experienced, we've had to renew the, the monoclonal antibodies that have been available to us. Why? Because we, um, there's, there was significant data that showed that, for instance, the, the monoclonal called uh, Regencov um, did not have uh, efficacy against Omicron. And as we know, since uh, mid-November, we've been uh, really having uh, an Omicron dominant pandemic. And that's when we had to shift to Satrivimab. Um, I do wanna say, do wanna be clear that as, as Rupali was mentioning, um, the benefit of monoclonals is really uh, when you basically treat someone who has uh, mild to moderate symptoms, who are not on oxygen and who have not been treated with other agents and who are diagnosed within seven days of the onset of, them, or of their symptoms or um, seven days of a positive test. So um, and they, these are consistent with the, the way these were authorized. Uh, and that's why I really wanna emphasize what Rupali said in terms of the fastest you get uh, diagnosed, the better it is and the more efficacy you would have if the treatment is started soon. For instance, with monoclonals, that, that timeline is seven days. Um, the monoclonals are found to be most efficacious if I start that within seven days uh, of symptom onset. Um, but when a patient is already severe, that is needing oxygen, that is having received remdesivir and, and steroids sometimes and other agents, then we've missed the window because what these are, are antibodies that boost the individual's uh, immune system. And that is something that antibodies really help us early on in the course of an infection. And cellular immunity is what, what's helping us later. Um, so it's important to make that distinction. So Dr. Nemi, is it fair to say that uh, with the you know, arrival of Omicron, uh, your uh, results with the antibody, the monoclonal antibody were different? Is that right? The, the, the Regencov monoclonal that we had been using for several months was no longer effective. That's why we had to go to a different agent called Sotravimab. And that, um, that uh, monoclonal has been shown to be efficacious. Um, now, uh, we will likely uh, see new mutations and new variants 
for which we would have to, again, pivot again to a different um, monoclonal. And we are already looking into those options, anticipating that um, the agents uh, that we currently use might not be efficacious in the future. And then the other question is, for the monoclonal antibodies, are they available to patients as outpatient or do they have to be in the hospital to receive them? The main idea is to really prevent the patient from being home and going to the hospital. So ideally, these monoclonal agents should be given before going to the hospital because I need to give it within the, the time frame where the patient has mild to moderate symptoms. When they're severe, they're often in the hospital. So I would say the bulk of our patients, we aim at giving monoclonals before the hospital. That is before they get sick enough. Uh, in the hospital, we have given monoclonals to patients who had been admitted for other reasons, were not on oxygen, had mild symptoms, right? But their admission was about something else. And that's why we were able to give that. But the way we're set up is that these infusions are outpatient for us and we do it at several sites. So primary care docs can really refer patients for monoclonal antibody therapy. Absolutely. And I'm gonna ask Rupali maybe to cover that aspect. Yeah, so I think um, as, as Dr. Neme was saying, this is an infusion given in a vein. And so um, we, throughout the pandemic, we have, um, we've really learned to understand that drug supply is kind of, is always changing as well as the variants are keeping us on our toes. And so really um, these medications, they are available um, but some, at, during times of the pandemic, it's been very hard sometimes to get every patient in. And so it's important um, to know that, yeah, there, it is available, but it might not be available for every single patient that may qualify. We are really trying to give it to the patients that are most at risk for developing complications. So it is available through a referral process through the UW Medicine, just so we can make sure that the supply and as well as um, that we can find the suitable place to give the infusion to the patient. So, you know, just for, you know, for the community, uh, if you have a diagnosis, it is worth a while to reach out to your primary doctor to see if you would qualify for the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the, the next thing, Rupali, is about the same about the antibodies. Are there any side effects? And then, can patients receive these antibodies uh, like repeatedly? Can they receive, receive them more than once? Yeah, so that's, those are great questions. Um, so the, the, the monoclonal antibodies, um, they can be given um, you know, more than once, but we prefer not to. These antibodies last in your system for almost three months. But as we learned, the virus is changing. And so we really, um, we really try to only give it to you once because the vaccine we also hope is working. And so we'd really prefer to just give it once. I don't know, Dr. Neme, did you wanna add, add to that? No, absolutely. I, I just wanna highlight the point that we aim uh, to give monoclonals to those patients who are severely immunocompromised. Why? Because that's a subset of patients right, the patient who has had a transplant, the patient who has had uh, cancer and is on active chemotherapy. Those are the patients that are at highest risk. Why? Because the response to the vaccine is limited because of that immune deficiency that is either intrinsic, kind of part of the patient's diagnosis, but more often there, there, there is an immunodeficiency that we as doctors try to um, create in a patient to make sure that we control potential rejection or other issues that the patient might have. An example would be a transplant patient or a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. So I would say most of the, the, the top priority for the monoclonals currently is those patients who are immunosuppressed, whose response to the vaccine is limited. If I'm healthy, and I'm younger than 65, 
and I don't have any comorbidities, including like other medical conditions, for example, hypertension, like high blood pressure, obesity, uh, diabetes, et cetera, then um, the benefit that a monoclonal uh, agent might give me is it's much less than a patient who's, because if I've been vaccinated and boosted, I should have a good response to the vaccine. And in reality, that's what we see. Those patients, those people who are vaccinated and boosted, that's the best thing they can do. And most of these patients would not need anything else unless they have other chronic medical problems. But if I'm immunocompromised, then yes, I would need something like sotravimab, this monoclonal, or we can then talk about um, the oral therapeutics like Paxlovid. And then Dr. Nemi, if someone gets monoclonal antibodies, can they still get their booster? Absolutely. Um, the initial recommendations was were to wait for 90 days, but now we know it's not a problem. And actually it's encouraged. And it's also encouraged to get vaccinated after COVID, get boosted after COVID. Uh, again, remember that this infection has continued to evolve and we know that uh, a booster is much more powerful than, than just being fully vaccinated without the booster, it's especially as the variants evolve. Uh, Rupali, how about pregnant women? And uh, uh, are they uh, eligible for the monoclonal antibodies? Yes, um, you know, pregnant, as we learned through the pandemic, pan, uh, pregnant women, are at risk for developing complications, both to themselves as well as to um, their child. And so it's important that pregnant women get vaccinated because that, that is the best prevention. But if the, if the pregnant woman um, you know, needs to get the, the, the monoclonal antibody, it is safe. It is, you know, it's not thought to be harmful. It's similar to other antibodies that are available. And it is recommended by most of the uh, societies um, to give it to pregnant women if they, if they qualify. Um, shifting gears a little bit to remdesivir. Uh, Rupali, can you please talk, talk a little bit about it? Is it only reserved for inpatient or is it, can it be given to outpatient uh, people in the outpatient setting as well? Yeah, so this is a great, uh, this, is, this is an interesting story because originally this drug, we were using it for our sickest of sick patients in the beginning of the pandemic as we were learning about it. And now we really, we use it in, in the hospital, but it's really be best for patients that are not too sick, but, but are but sick enough to be in the hospital. And then in the middle of the pandemic, I think it was during the Delta wave, um, our colleagues at Fred Hutchinson Cancer um, Center, they, 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 they enrolled a lot of patients in this, in, in this study and they found that it, giving it outpatient to people that don't require oxygen just for a shorter course, so three days instead of five, that they can, that they can prevent hospitalization. And so this was a really interesting um, finding because we've learned about this drug over two years, we've changed the way we've used it. And um, it's, it's a really nice testament to how, how much we're learning throughout this pandemic and how we've been able to use the therapies that we know work and continue to use and find new ways to use it. So Rupali, is, uh, are the outpatient docs able to prescribe this then? So it's a little bit harder to do, um, you know, outpatient this, because it is three days of therapy, we, you know, and, you know it's, it's harder to find infusion spaces versus the monoclonal antibody. It's a one, one infusion for one day and that's good. Um, you're good for, for 90 days. And so really um, the IV remdesivir, it's a little bit harder to do in the outpatient clinic. And there are sites that are doing it um, in Washington, like our colleagues at Valley Medicine, they're doing it for their pregnant patients, but we, um, it's, a, it's a little bit harder to do at the freestanding infusion centers. Thank you. Um, I would like to just briefly, uh, uh, Dr. Neme, talk about, uh, just touch upon ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. We did have some questions from the community about those two medications. Are they at all indicated 
as COVID therapeutics? The answer is no. Uh, there's been many, many studies proving that ivermectin does not only make a difference, it also can be toxic. So we really need to stay away from ivermectin. And in the US, fortunately, it's an uncommon practice to prescribe this, although we have seen that and we have seen that in our city. Um, but the, what's going on in the rest of the country is that folks are getting a hold of you know, ivermectin for, for animals, for horses, for cattle. And these are very, very high doses and it can be very toxic. The short answer is let's not waste our time. Let's not get sick from ivermectin that we don't need. So I would discourage that. And the same thing for hydroxychloroquine. It's, it's been found time and again to be ineffective. So I would not uh, waste my time doing that. I don't know, I welcome uh, Rupali's thoughts since she's really well versed in this research. Yeah, I think also, Dr. Chopra, this is also how, something that we've learned throughout the pandemic. In the beginning, we were searching for any possible therapies. And so in the beginning, we were looking at any possible thing that we saw in the lab that may translate and may be able to give into patients. So in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, we were giving hydroxychloroquine for some patients. Once more information came out and more studies, we, we really, we saw the harm. Didn't, you know, there were some studies published around the world that showed patients um, had high doses and they resulted in um, cardiac um, arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats and it really scared us. And so the, the current guidelines are not to use this. Now, this has also been studied um, in prevention at some of our colleagues at, U, at UW, uh, University of Washington. And they have also shown that it doesn't help prevent you um, from getting COVID. And again, the tried and true prevention has been the vaccine. So just to reiterate it, not only are these medications not indicated, but they can be really harmful and toxic. Um, Rupali, can you also uh, please tell us about Evusheld? What is this medicine made of? How is it administered? And which patients are good candidate candidates for this? Yeah, maybe we'll split this up with, uh, with Dr. Neme, but let me, let me just talk about the, the technology a little bit, but it's very similar to citrovimab in that it is a lab generated antibody. Again, so it means that it's specifically made in the lab to target, um, to target the, uh, the, the corona, I almost lost the, the name of the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV virus. And it's really meant to stay in a patient's body for six months. And what this does is it's, it's an additional layer of protection in addition to the vaccine. So as Dr. Neme was saying, patients that have weakened immune systems, they get the vaccine and they, because they have a weakened immune system, they can't generate their own antibodies, right? And so this is an additional layer that helps our, our vulnerable patients, such as the transplant patients, cancer patients, get additional protection for this. And so what we really are, are saving this, this medication is really designed for and authorized for patients with weakened immune systems. So are, is, uh, currently, is it being given at UW uh, Medical Center sites, infusion sites? Dr. Name, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, so um, we're seeing a significant demand for the prevention uh, monoclonal Evusheld because we do serve uh, a large population of immunocompromised patients. And especially important, this would be, especially this would be important in the context of, um, of the masking uh, being lifted and other things that are pretty dynamic right now. And potentially they, there could be, uh, whenever we lift, uh, lift uh, masking, there could be an increase in cases. So these are the individuals who wouldn't be necessarily protected because of the decreased immune system. We currently have a couple of sites across UW Medicine where we are giving um, this medication. Um, 
And uh, we were also hoping to expand our services in the inpatient setting. That is when, it, when one of these severely immunocompromised patients who meets criteria for Evusheld are being discharged from the hospital, we will, um, we're planning on, on giving them Evusheld as they leave the hospital, which will help us really go through the, the, the large number of patients we need to go through uh, because the resources in the outpatient setting can be pretty tight, um, given that there are many, many indications for infusions, including every shell. So Dr. it's, it's Oprah, a, yeah. yes, you, you can, you, can um, you know, the, the availability of this, we are working with the doctors that treat these patients, um, the ones, for example, that um, are getting the transplants, and we are really working with them to find the patients that 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 will, can get this injection. So we're really trying to make sure to to include as many patients as possible. So it's an infusion, and or no, it's an injection. Injection, and the primary care docs can uh, perhaps uh, refer patients or fill out uh, eligibility criteria forms. Am I correct with that? Or can refer them? Can can they work with the with the ID folks? Yeah, we are working with so the the doctors that take care of the immunosuppressed patients. We're working with those doctors mainly because they are often treating those patients and seeing those patients often, and having them send us referrals um, because we again it's we really want to get those those patients that are really immunosuppressed. So they've gotten the transplant within the last year. Um, and for patients that are on specific medications that don't let your body make antibodies. And so we are working with those um, doctors within the UW medicine system to, to refer their patients that are on these therapies. So patients- yeah, to, to, to be more specific, I just wanna, a lot of people, even providers think that immunocompromised means poorly controlled diabetes mm -hmm. or things like that. No, we're talking about a subset of patients who have a specific immune deficiency problem that's often part of their disease, like having advanced HIV, or it's part of their treatment, like having had a transplant and then having to have their immune system suppressed, right? So this is why we're saying that we're talking specifically to those infectious disease doctors who manage these patients because these are either transplant patients, cancer patients, and also we're talking to rheumatologists as well. So it, it's, I think normally people think of immunocompromise by thinking about diabetes and other things. These are criteria set by the National Institutes of Health. So they're pretty strict as to what they mean. And it's a very high priority of immunosuppression. So, so Evishel at this time is available to patients who are highly immunosuppressed, the people who've had transplant. So it's not something that primary care docs can prescribe for patients who have chronic ongoing conditions. So it's very important for us to understand that. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Are there any side effects, Dr. Neme, from this therapy, from Evisheld? Yeah, so Evisheld is given uh, through injection, right, into, into the gluteal area. And okay. um, the most common side effect that you can have is pain at the site of, uh, of the injection um, and some discomfort associated with the injection. But we have not really seen uh, any significant side effect. I mean, we, you know, the, the side effect that we worry uh, the most is what we call anaphylaxis, like this reaction that's a systemic whole body reaction where your throat closes, your, but we haven't really seen cases uh, like that. And we're also prepared to assist the patient should they occur because those severe reactions occur within 15 minutes of the administration and we're watching the patient for an hour after they get the injection. So we're monitoring the patient to make sure that they're safe. And, and again, this is not a, a drug per se that would interact with other medications or anything. 
So there's very few contraindications really. And we do watch patients. Uh, I don't know, Rupal, if you want to talk a little bit about the process. Yeah, one of the things um, before, yeah, before I go into that, the process, um, it was studied, um, this is meant for pre-exposure prophylax. So it's very similar to the vaccine in that it's not used for treatment. It's not used if you've had a high risk exposure and it's actually been studied in that setting. So one of the criteria we ask our patients before we give the injection is, you know, have you, um, you know, do you actively have COVID now? And, um, or we recently had a high risk exposure, maybe a family member in your, in your household or because it won't work for that setting. And it was actually shown not to be helpful for those, for those circumstances. And so, so the important, yeah, go ahead. The important difference between monoclonal antibodies, the MAP therapy as well, uh, and the Evisheld is Evisheld is given for pre-exposure prophylaxis while MAB is given to actively treat uh, COVID infection. Just for clarification, they're all MABs, yes. right? They're all monoclonals. So Evusheld is the name for the prevention monoclonal. And then Sotrovimab is the one for the treatment. And Sotrovimab is only IV infusion and Evusheld is the injection. It's a little this is really helpful. This is very, very helpful, and it really clarifies a lot for, for uh, our patients. Um, Dr. Nemi, I, I would like to move on to the oral medications that are now recommended that perhaps the primary care docs must be prescribing by now. And the first one is the molnupiravir. Uh, it was recently approved. It's very exciting for primary care physicians like myself who can now prescribe this medication. It's a ray of hope. Can you please tell us about this? Who are the ideal candidates for this medication? So we have uh, two agents, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. Uh, and the, the issue with Molnupiravir is the fact that it's much less efficacious. So we're talking about an efficacy of around 30%. Um, versus the efficacy of Paxlovid, which is close to 90%. So very different efficacy uh, profiles. Uh, they're both safe. Uh, one thing about molnupiravir is that it's contraindicated for women who are pregnant, for instance, or who are um, conceiving, right? So, um, so that's, the, that's one of the issues with molnupiravir. And, um, and given the lower efficacy, although it's widely available at pharmacies and one can directly prescribe that without talking to any of the, the other doctors from like Rupali or me or Dr. Dunaretti, um, it, it, is, it is an inferior choice. Um, so we're not seeing a significant uptick of this product. And then we have the um, Paxlovid, which again is the Pfizer, it's the drug made by, by Pfizer that has very high efficacy. And this drug is interesting because uh, number one, we really need to know when the patient started having symptoms or, where, or when they tested positive because I need that window to be up to five days. If it's more than five days, it is too late for us to start this oral medicine. The second thing I need to know is their health, their medications. Why? Because there are interactions. There are some of the, the drugs are incompatible with each other when you put that drug in the mix, the Paxlovid. So we need to know exactly what kinds of medications the patients are taking. And we also need to know the kidney function. How well are the patient's kidney, uh, kidneys working? Why? Because there's an adjustment of the dose depending on that number. So we want a relatively uh, recent level of what we call creatinine, which is a measure of your kidney or renal fun function. So these are the main things that we need to know. Um, and this is why we have an incredible pharmacy team who can help us um, kind of go through some of these questions. And for providers, we've come up with um, 
materials that really walk him through um, how to really navigate the interactions that incompatible drugs with Paxlovid. Um, and the key again is to give it within five days a symptom onset or positive test. Um, and then the other thing we could talk a little bit, um, maybe Rupali wants to touch base on this, but the, um, the you know, we, we have uh, for months now helped uh, patients get Paxlovid, um, patients who did not have access to transportation to pick it up. So we have coordinated delivery for patients. Um, and then we have done, we have had uh, pickup options for patients as well. Um, now this is, um, there's more Paxlovid in terms of supply and there's more distribution where you would find Paxlovid today at a Safeway pharmacy, for instance. So I don't know, Rupali, if you want to talk a little bit more about Paxlovid, for instance. Yeah, I think this is a really exciting um, advancement for COVID therapies, that the fact that we can do the orals and we can move away from injections and patients can take these therapies in their home. I think, um, as Dr. Neme was saying, this is why it's so important if you have symptoms to test right away, because these medications really work when they are given as soon as possible. Um, the, we are really lucky that we have availability of Paxlovid. Many of the pharmacies across Washington, across our state, really are, are stocking more and more of the Paxlovid as well as the Molnupiravir. And so it's often available even closer to your home, whether you, know, whether you live in the King County area or if you live on the other side of the state, you know, this is becoming more and more available. Uh, Rupali, can you uh, talk a little bit about, I know that uh, primary care physicians are able to prescribe uh, molnupiravir freely now. Is that the same thing with Paxlovid as well? Correct. Yeah. Paxlovid is available um, Yeah, through um, the UW medicine system, but also at the local pharmacies. And so if it's convenient for the patient to come to the Montlake campus, for example, we have a um, drive uh, a pickup, a pickup area where a patient doesn't even have to leave their car and the, the medic, the pharmacy staff will bring out the medication to their car. We have a similar setup at, at Harborview. It's at a specific um, uh, pharmacy at um, Harborview called the GCT um, Pharmacy. And then also at the Northwest campus, we are partnering with Northwest Prescriptions. And so uh, patients can go um, there if that's a more convenient location. In addition to those, again, there, it is available at pharmacies across Washington state. I That's just really wanted helpful. to add, um, who is Paxlovid gonna help the most? It's gonna be patients within the, the five day, right? But it's gonna be a patient with mild to moderate symptoms too. And it's gonna be someone who has comorbidities. If I'm completely healthy, my symptoms are barely, barely felt, right? Just like very mild symptoms and I'm fully vaxxed and boosted. I, I don't know how much Paxlova is gonna help me, right? So it's, it, it's, it's kind of an equation of thinking, am I within the five days? And then do I know the kidney function? Do I know the interactions? And let's look at the patient's health. An entirely healthy young person who's fully vaxxed and boosted with minimal symptoms or no symptoms would not really uh, benefit from this. It would be for the large number of patients in our, in our health system and in our community who do have comorbidities, who do have mild to moderate symptoms and are within that time frame. Uh, Rupali, can you talk a little bit about how these medications work? Sure. So it, it, the, both of these medications are what we call antivirals. So they work directly on the virus when it is in your system. And so how a virus makes copies of itself and, and goes throughout the, the bloodstream and into the lungs and the, the medication stops it from making copies. So the Paxlovid basically stops the, the virus from making essential proteins. So then it just cannot function. 
the molnupiravir in a similar way, it, it makes it it makes the um, the virus make lots of mistakes when it's making copies of itself, and when it makes these mistakes, it can't survive. And so they both work relatively similarly, but they are they are definitely um, a little bit different, as as Dr. Neme was saying in their um, potency. How about for pregnant women? Are these medications okay to be prescribed, or are they contraindicated? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, going back to what Dr. Neme was saying, we really need to find out if it's if it's right for for the patient. But it is um, the the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine has um, stated that if if it is indicated, it is safe to give in pregnancy. Now, part of the Paxlovid is a medication that we've used for many years in HIV patients. And so we have experience with using it in pregnant um, HIV patients. And so based on that information, as well as additional information they did when they authorized it, that it is, um, can be given to, to pregnant women if, if it's appropriate. Dr. Nemi, what are some of the side effects uh, from these medications that people can expect? Yeah, so the most common side effects that, that we've seen are nausea, diarrhea, GI, kind of gastrointestinal, stomach um, symptoms. And that's not dissimilar to, to any really medication that contains that ritonavir, that, that additional drug in Paxlovid. Um, some patients, to be honest, struggle with this and, and, and can stop it, actually, if the symptoms are severe. Some patients take this with food and they, they, they do their best and they continue and they finish the treatment. It is important, you know, whenever you start a treatment to try to, um, to try to finish it, to complete it. And sometimes we can add an anti-nausea medication to really help with this, or maybe, maybe a stomach medication that will decrease the, 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 the acid, et cetera. But um, in most cases, I would say most people continue to take it and but a large number of people um, stop taking it because of those uh, issues. Um, but I, I would like to hear from Rupali, who's really closer to um, to this data. Yeah, I think um, I think Dr. Neme said it right. I think a lot of those nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and that can be hard when you've got COVID, right? You have some of those symptoms. You're not feeling well, um, and so you already you're you're not at your best. So having those additional side effects is not easy. One of the other side effects that's unique um, to Paxlovid, but not unique to COVID, is a, a metallic, a, a an abnormal taste in, in your mouth. Patients have described it as like a metallic taste, um, and it really occurs when, um, when, right after they take the medication. And there has been patients that have taken it, and it's been too much, and they, they, they don't they lose their appetite because that metallic taste is not great. And so that's not a good thing either. When you're sick, you, you need to be eating and drinking and, and, um, and doing all those regular, uh, you know, all of those regular things. And so if you're having those side effects, reach out to your doctor, you know, that's really important to do because we don't want these side effects to make, uh, to make you too sick. One of the questions that we had was, are these medications approved for kids? or how young can they be given? Yeah, that's a great question. So molnupiravir, I'm glad you brought that up. Molnupiravir is only approved for patients that are above 18 years or older. And this is really because they found that it can cause um, some of that cartilage that we have in our bodies. It may, it may stop the formation of that. So they are not recommending that for anybody less than um, 18 years or of, of age. The Paxlovid can be used for um, kids um, as young as 12 um, if, if, if it's needed. I don't have a lot of experience with pediatrics, but it, it has been authorized by the FDA. And I believe that you need to weigh above 40 kilograms so um, as well. Dr. Nemi, um, uh, you mentioned that it should be given within five days of testing positive. Are the home tests okay? When we say test positive, is the home test okay? Absolutely, the home test is good enough, but just to be clear, within five days of symptom onset, 
So the time where your symptoms start, if you have no symptoms, it would be from the time you had a positive test. But remember, these drugs are indicated if you have symptoms, mild to moderate. Um, so I would say um, it's from the onset of symptoms from when that begins. It's five days, yeah. So it's not uh, from the ons uh, from the time that they test positive, but it's from when the symptoms started. Exactly. What led you to get tested, right? If it was just an exposure, then it's less compelling to use this because you want to, you know, it, if you don't have symptoms, it's less helpful. Yeah, they're only they're only um, authorized for treatment, so not for post-exposure prophylaxis or pre-prophylaxis, these are meant just for patients that have symptoms and are testing positive. And I will, I will say that, um, you know, the home tests, they it's such a great advance for us to have this extra layer of security. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, 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 it's a new thing that we haven't had an opportunity to test in our own house um, and not to go to a lab. Um, I really, I, I think they're very reliable. Um, and if you get a positive test, it's, it's, pro it is definitely positive. And to reassure, you know, I, I'm a pharmacist, so I make sure to look at the expiration date. You know, some of the tests, they, you know, they, they're only good for a year. So if you're worried about it, look at the expiration date, see if it, you know, but it is, um, they should be used. They should be, um, they are very accurate. Yeah, and also check out the, the, the community conversation we did on testing where we went through the different kinds. Um, but what I would say is if you're having symptoms and your test is positive, infection confirmed. <laughs> if you test negative and you have symptoms, I would either do another one in a few hours or the next day, or I would seek a PCR test because there is a possibility that you have what we call a false negative. That is in 20% of cases, I might test negative when I have it. But when it's positive, it is positive and confirmed. And Dr. Neme, if, they have, if someone gets uh, Paxlovid or the Molnipiravir, are they okay getting their boosters or do they have to wait? Absolutely. I would wait until I'm recovered, right? Until I'm feeling better and kind of more normal and then don't wait anymore and do it right away. Because again, um, Paxlovid doesn't give you long lasting protection. It's not a monoclonal, right? It's just, it's just blocking at the beginning of the infection. Um, but yeah, the recommendation is that you get up to date on your vaccinations. That means if you're not vaccinated, you get vaccinated and you start the series. And if you're fully vaccinated and need the booster, go ahead and get it. Because there's tons, tons of data now that shows that boosters are extremely effective at preventing uh, hospitalization, severe disease and death in, in times of Omicron, much more than just having the two doses or the one J and J. We do have a few minutes. Uh, so Dr. Neme, would you like to talk about the new mask guidelines, what it means for people? Are they okay taking off their masks indoors? And especially if some people are not com uh, comfortable taking off their masks, what should they be doing? I would say that I think that we need to understand pandemics as, as a global issue. It's not a singular thing, it's not an individual. Thing. Of course, you care about your own health, but you should really care about the health of other people and, and the community. Um, what I would say is that I, uh, I think that people need to remember that although they're vaccinated and, and boosted, um, the risk of COVID, um, definitely the risk of getting severe COVID is very, very low, ultra low if I'm boosted. Um, but it's not the same for those very immunocompromised folks that we just talked about, where their response to the vaccine is rather limited, where we are trying to give them monoclonals like Evusel to, to help them kind of make up for that uh, decreased response to the vaccine. So therefore we need to think that when we're out at a pharmacy, we might 
really bump into these people, right, who are immunocompromised. So I will keep masking indoors for the time being, and I, I really want to see the rates are way down, like really, really low, like close to zero for me to be comfortable unmasking in a place that where we all share and we all have to go, like a pharmacy, like a grocery store, right? So um, my recommendation, I, I think it's a very small uh, thing to ask really people to continue to mask indoors in those spaces, particularly in large spaces with a lot of people where the density of people is super high. And the other thing, it's really nice that we're about to, to, to welcome the spring and it, it will be an occasion for us to be outside and socialize with friends outside. I personally have only dined outside with friends and not indoors because obviously when you eat, you have to take off your mask. So um, the way I see this, a lot of things are changing. Um, I think that we definitely know that masking prevents infections. Uh, they just do. We know that because when we have a surge, we mask and then rates come down. And that's what happens. I think the mandate is good for the mandate to go away. But I think that our population has learned that masking works. And we all need to understand you know, that we, we should continue to use our masks especially when we think about the other people we live with. And uh, for instance, for me and Rupali is the patients we see, and you, uh, the patients we see, I don't see myself leaving um, masking uh, in front of a patient because the last thing I can think of is really giving COVID to uh, someone who is immunocompromised and doesn't have that response. So in summary, I would say masking works. I will continue to mask indoors. I will continue to mask with my patients. Um, and uh, I think folks need to really consider um, unmasking and think about where. And I would say definitely a space where I would feel safe is outdoors. Uh, you're on mute, Anita. Sorry. Would you like to talk about the type of masks? In one of our previous uh, community conversations, you gave us a very good uh, you know, detailed uh, breakdown on masks. And now that the cases are lower, what would you be comfortable wearing yourself while indoors? And what would you recommend to people? I personally like three or more layers. And I specifically like to find a good fit. Because if I have an excellent mask, but it's loose, then that mask is not working, right? You want to have a tight fitting mask and you want to have three or more layers. I'm a fan of the KN95s, that they're, they're five layers and they're very collapsed. So it really feels like one thing and it's soft and it's tight. Make sure you tie a knot here if you, if you wanna create that tightness, but I think it's necessary. Um, so I, would, I will stick with my uh, KN95s, the KF94s are great. If you have what we call a level three, which are the three uh, layer surgical masks uh, that say ATM3, that's perfect too. But again, don't forget mouth, uh, mouth and nose and then tight. It has to be tight to the point where it still feels comfortable, but you actually have a good seal. And, and then you know about the proper hygiene of a mask. You, you basically use it until you see that it's um, that the integrity of the mask is is kind of falling apart. And the other thing I would say, if you if you have an activity where you're going to be masked in front of many people for several hours, then that mask probably is not one that I would probably reuse because I would expect that to be somewhat moist and the integrity maybe lose um, lose some integrity in that. So I would um, and then remember that you can always use a uh, wear a mask and then put it on the shelf or inside a paper bag and store it there and you can revisit that mask in five days so you don't have to have a box of masking and really a mask and and really use them every day because i think that's wasteful i personally like to reuse my mask uh, several times especially when i'm doing those short things like running into the grocery store 
or um, open, you know, opening the door of my house and welcoming someone, those types of things. If I'm going to spend three hours at a, at a piano concert, um, I'm probably going to, you know, that's a lot of exposure. So I would probably um, toss that one. And, uh, but for brief interactions, um, I'm, I could use the same mask for a week and it's okay. So for your protection and for others, especially people who are immunocompromised, uh, you would suggest people to continue indoor masking. And uh, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and don't, don't surrender to the bullies. Um, you do what you think is best. And, and uh, I honestly don't care if people think that I'm, that I'm doing something extra because to be honest, I feel very comfortable. And also I haven't had a cold in two years. So I, I like to keep it that way. And I think it's a very small thing to ask to protect our greater community. I think this is really important for those of us with little kids to not uh, let other people dictate your choices. And if your kids feel comfortable wearing a mask, you know, let them go to school with a mask. Rupali, would you like to say anything, add anything to this? No, I mean, I, I, I agree 100% with Dr. Deme and I learned a few things too. Um, you know, I, you know, even with like the flu vaccine or any, anything, I, I just am, think of all the patients that have gone through so much that have the weakened immune systems have gone through the transplants. I would hate to be responsible for getting some of those patients sick. Like they've already gone through so much, you know, and that's what I think of every time when I go to the grocery store, um, you know, going to the library, wherever I'm going, I, I need to, you know, that's what I'm thinking. So I don't know if that's an okay way to end, but. Thank you so very much, Dr. Neme and Rupali. Thank you so much for this wonderful, very informative session. And you really broke down the complicated uh, world of uh, COVID therapeutics, uh, you know, very simply for all of us to understand. So we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for again you. to our panelists. There is a link in the chats where you can find the recording of the session. It will be uploaded. Please feel free to share with your friends and family um, and their previous recordings of our previous sessions there as well. Um, so please take care and stay safe and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.